Sunday morning. Glad to see everybody. And let's open up in a word of prayer. All wise and eternal Father, Lord, we thank you for bringing us here this morning. We thank you for how you've kept us all week long, moment by moment. Thank you for the times that even when our mind has drifted away, Lord, you still were faithful in keeping us and even bringing us back to um, thoughts of you, Lord. We thank you for your son and the finished work of Jesus Christ. We thank you for your Holy Spirit and his abiding work in our hearts. We pray, Lord, as the message goes forth today, Lord, that we will hear what you have to say to us, Lord. That we will continue to have use those ears that you have for us to hear your word and the minds that you give us to think about your word and the hearts to um, respond to your word, even in our life, daily life. Pray, Lord, for those who may be still on their way that you will give them safe travel mercy. Bless this time in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hi, good morning, everyone. Uh, we're going to have uh, communion at this time. And uh, take a few moments to uh, prepare as uh, the elements are being passed out. Um, we want to uh, take a few moments and reflect and and uh, uh, just think on uh, if there's anything between us and God to uh, profess those uh, privately to him and um, remove any barriers to fellowship. Uh, so let's just take a few moments to pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to commune with you in the oneness that we have in you because of Christ. Thank you for this time. I ask you to bless it in Jesus' name. Okay. <clears throat> so, our thought this morning um, is from 1 Corinthians 1, uh, 9. And uh, we've been hearing a lot about faith. And, uh, and here last uh, month, um, Pastor Ronald has been talking about that. We've heard a lot of messages regarding faith. Uh, we have faith because God is faithful. So this morning, uh, God is faithful by whom you were called unto the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And the word fellowship there is the same word for communion in the Greek, it's koinonia. So we're talking about the same thing. Because God is faithful, and we have this calling, we may have this, we have this opportunity to fellowship him. We have this opportunity to be in communion, unity with him. Uh, the Lord keeps his covenants. And because he has finished the work of the new covenant, and you trusted in him, both who he is and what he has done, we have peace. What a beautiful thing. What a beautiful thing. Ephesians um, 1 talks about the time that we had believed we were sealed with the Holy, Holy Spirit, Spirit of God. We were sealed. And that Holy Spirit is the earnest of our inheritance. What does that mean? That means that an earnest is kind of like a down payment. It's also uh, an assurance that something will happen. And um, so when you, you, when you believe, you receive the Holy Spirit. That Holy Spirit uh, 
comforter uh, was sent by the Father in the name of the Son. Okay, so because of that act of God, because you put your trust in Him, your faith in the, the faith in the faithful God, you have a future. You have an inheritance. Ephesians 2, <clears throat> 13 and 18 says, But now in Christ Jesus you were who were sometimes were afar off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. Think about that. It says, For he is our peace, who hath made both one and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us. We no longer have separation between us. We have access. Having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, by the cross. So, and what was the result of that? said and came and preached peace to you who were afar off and to them that were nigh for through him we have both access by one spirit unto the father hallelujah praise him praise him we have access to the father Father Jesus Christ He is both the Hebrews 12.2 author and finisher of faith. And he is also, in Hebrews 13.20, the author and the giver of peace. <clears throat> because you put your faith and trust in Christ, you have peace with God. He is the faithful one who has promised. 10 to 23. So we want to think this morning about God's faithfulness, keep his promises, and um, the work that was done on the cross on our behalf. So um, I'm going to begin uh, with the, this um, communion, uh, act, this act. But uh, really, the communion is with, in, with, with God in our hearts because we have a relationship with him. On the night that he was betrayed, he, said, he, he uh, gave thanks and he broke the bread. And he said, take, eat. This is my body broken for you. So do this in remembrance of me. Who he is and what he's done. Hmm. And after the same manner, he took the cup. He took the cup. And this is the cup of promise that Christ will come back. For his bride. Thank you, Lord. He said, This is the cup of the New Testament, the New Testament, in my blood. This do as often as you do it, do it in, in remembrance. Take it. Father, we do thank you, Lord, for what was done <clears throat> for us through the work and person of your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you, God, that we have peace with you because of what you have accomplished on the cross. The finished work of Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord. We 
Jesus' name. Morning, everybody. Um, can we uh, all stand and turn to Exodus chapter twelve? Verse 3, speak ye unto all the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of this month they shall take to them every man a lamb, according to the house of their fathers, a lamb from a house. And we're going to go to 5. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. Ye shall take it out from the sheep or from the goats, and ye shall keep it unto the four, uh, fourteenth day of the same month, and the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. And they shall take of the blood and strike it on the two side posts and on the upper door posts of the houses wherein they shall eat it. All right, let's turn to Revelations chapter 3. Uh, Revelation chapter 3. All right. We're going to read verse 20. All right. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will... Come in to him, and will sup with him, and he with me. All right. Let's um all pray for the message. Amen. Thank you, Miles. Good morning, everybody. So, um, Pastor Ronaldo asked me to speak on this subject, and it's basically on communion, which we just enjoyed. Communion. The, 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 the disciples were, they came in together. Drank the wine, broke the bread, and Jesus explained that this was the beginning of a brand new covenant, a new testament, a new contract. And this would have been something that would have been a little astounding to the disciples. But what is this based upon? We call it the Last Supper. But what is it based upon? And you rem remember in the reading there that it was at the time of Passover. They're doing this. The disciples are getting together for Passover. They're planning on doing Passover. And so we just read the initial parts of the instructions for Passover. Passover was instituted by God. It's one of the very few ceremonies that God gives instructions on what to do. Um, there are seven basic feasts in the Jewish year in the, in the Torah. And Passover is the first one. Passover in Egypt here the very first time God was planning on judging Egypt God was going to tell Egypt hands off my kids God told Moses at the burning bush he said tell Pharaoh that Israel is my child and if you don't let me have my child I'm going to take your child and, of course, we've all seen the various movies, so we know that eventually, you know, Pharaoh lost his son and the first one was gone. In Exodus 12, um, he just read the opening part there, but we're going to find out. Let's go ahead and continue on. Chapter 12. Um, verse 8. You should eat the flesh in that night, roast with fire and unleavened bread. 
the bitter herbs you shall eat it. Verse 10, And you shall let nothing ever remain until the morning, and that which remains over the morning shall be burnt with fire. You shall eat it with your loins girded, your shoes on your feet, your staff in your hand. You shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. These are instructions. You had to take a lamb on the 10th, bring it to the house, and then keep it there for four days. What happens to the lamb for during that four days? What happens to the family during that four days? What happens to the children during that four days? Lambs are cute, right? What, are they, what do you think happens? Uh, can we give it a name? Can I put a ribbon on it? Oh, look, it's licking my finger. Yeah, we got to kill it Thursday or Friday. But they get attached to it. And, but something, this is a sacrifice. And he mentioned you had to take the blood, put it on two side posts and on the top. And the reason for this is God's going to judge Egypt. Egypt would not let the Israelites go. God promised way back in, to Abraham, about 400 years earlier, that eventually when the, when the oppressors let them go, they would send them away with riches, gold, and fine clothes. And this is about to happen. What's going to happen? Verse 12, I will pass through the land of Egypt this night and will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast. And against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. God is judging the false gods of Egypt. God is exposing them for the frauds that they are and the weaknesses, and the weaknesses that they have. So, Passover. The angel of judgment covers the land of Israel, going one house at a time. And, it's, and if it comes to a house, it's going to take out the firstborn of everything. Just think about in your family. Who is the firstborn in your family? Dead. The firstborn that, um, that your, your dogs had. Firstborn cow, sheep. Firstborn. God had made a declaration that the first, um, the firstborn, the one that opens the womb, is mine. And God says that um, he's there to collect mine. And it, this death angel is on a mission, and it's going to do that. If, you're, if your father was the firstborn in his family, gone. But when it sees the blood, when this angel sees the blood, his Passover passes over the house. Passover. I want you to think about this. The Passover means that judgment is passed over. Death angel is going around and it says, okay, time to get this address. And it moves in and it sees the blood. And, and he says, nope, I'm going to pass over this house. Did the angel check to see that everybody inside the house was behaving themselves? Angel check that there was no idols in the house? Did the angel check that there was no immorality in the house? No. What did it check for? Blood. This is Passover. Passover is one of seven um, fundamental feasts in the Jewish calendar. Passover happens, like we said, it's on the 14th of Nisan. It's on, it could be a Thursday or a Friday, depending on how the calendar cycles through. Maybe even a Wednesday sometimes. But traditionally, we picture Passover on, on, a, on a Friday, as in Good Friday. But Passover happens, there's a feast of unleavened bread. And again, unleavened bread is used in the Passover activity. Unleavened bread means bread without leaven, without yeast. It's flat bread. Unleavened bread, and this is a seven-day feast. It celebrates um, as part of the Passover cycle. And then the first Sunday, the first day of the week after Passover, whatever Passover is, the following Sunday, and actually it's called the eighth day, which you count through seven, the next one's a one, right? But the eighth day, it's a big deal because you see eighth day is happening a lot in the priest um, preparation, 
in the ordination process. The eighth day, first fruits. It seems like a simple thing. It's, it's when you bring in your first fruits of your crops. It's like most cultures have some sort of agricultural celebration. In this case, though, this is bringing in first fruits. These three events are mirrored perfectly by Christ, who is sacrificed on Passover. He was buried unleavened bread. It is buried, and we'll see how that works in the actual Passover events. And buried, leaven speaks of sin all throughout the Bible. And Jesus had no sin, therefore he is unleavened. No sin, no yeast, nothing to corrupt. Um, when they were doing their very first Passover, they had to do it in a hurry. They had to eat standing up. They had to make sure that um, their, their bags were packed because at any moment, the Egyptians were going to rise up and say, get out of here. Okay? Eat standing up. If you're a guy living in college, you know eat standing up means you grab a microwave meal, <laughs> sit over the sink and eat, right? In a hurry. Eat standing up. Then there's a fourth feast, Pentecost. This is in the summer in some 50 days or seven weeks in a day, 49 plus one days later on. This is the only feast that says you must have leaven in the bread, which is really weird. But this is the feast that on that day, the church was born. Because on that day, Pentecost is when the gift of the Holy Spirit was given to the church age and you and I have the benefit of being permanently filled with God's Holy Spirit. In the Old Testament, he came and went, depending on how spiritual you were that day. If you're a little extra focused and you had a special mission, he'd come and help you. And that's why David prayed, please don't take your spirit from me. It is not a legitimate concern for us. But on that day, then there's a Feast of Trumpets. It's a feast that historically goes back to the trump of God that called Israel together on Mount Sinai. And there are two trumps of God. The second trump is the trump of God that calls the church to heaven at the rapture. Then there's a day of atonement, which historically is when the priest had to go in and sacrifice the lamb and pay for the sins. Of course, there is a future coming day of atonement for Israel at the end of the tribulation period. The Feast of Tabernacles, the word tabernacle simply means tents. The Feast of Tabernacles, once Israel was in the Promised Land, they were supposed to celebrate the fact that they used to live in tents in the wilderness and now they have houses. And they were supposed to thank God that they used to be wanderers and now they have homes, they used to... Uh, uh, live day by day in the wilderness and now they have houses and they're supposed to be celebrating God and telling the rest of the world our God is great. You invite Gentiles in and say um, when, they when a Gentile walks past your house they say why are you living in a tent right now because they would set up tents. You go through Pikesville during Shukot now you can see they set little tents or lean-tos up on their balconies or outside the house. And that's the whole idea. We used to live in tents. And this type of attitude also happened in the Passover. Um, the idea, they would dress up real nice. And they'd say, we used to be living in the wilderness. We used to live in rags. We used to day by day. But now God has made us princes, made us kings, has made us you know, royalty in a sense. So... We're going to focus on Passover. What I want to do is I want to jump to page 22. I mean, page 22. Verse 22. Same Exodus 12, 22. This is the extra details here. And you shall take a bunch of hyssop and dip it in the blood that is in the basin and strike the lintel top and the two side posts with the blood that is in the basin. And none of you shall go out of the door of the house until this morning. This is extra details, and the question is, what's this basin all about? And the answer is, in the ancient world, if you wanted to dedicate your house to a certain god, and Egypt had hundreds of them, uh, at, the, at the threshold, you would put blood down there. They would kill an animal and sacrifice to your god, 
And you can see pictures of fancy buildings that have actual basins in the bottom threshold there. In the slave quarters, probably not that fancy, but you're going to go through this anyway. What we're going to do is God is saying, I'm going to make a contract with you, just like God made with Abraham when they took animals, cut them in half, and, and did the unilateral promise where God gave Abraham, saying that this land and this people will be mine forever. And they're saying, you're going to do a sacrifice. The lamb that you have is going to shed his blood. And just put a bowl on the side, and it's down at the bottom. And so we have blood on the bottom and the top and the two sides. And hopefully you can start seeing we're going to go somewhere with this. Not just a ceremony. God sets up this ceremony as a picture of him. But you have this doorway that now has blood right here, right here, right here, and down here on the bottom. And he says, you don't cross that. It's a threshold covenant. And God is saying, I'm making a covenant with you, just like they make one with their, with, their, with their gods. I'm making a threshold covenant, and you don't cross that threshold. You honor that. And he says, you're going to be there. This is your protection. You're behind that threshold. So, the Passover meal that the disciples went to, they're coming to Passover. And they all know what Passover is. They know all the stages. The word Passover, Seder, means order. There are steps to a Passover meal. It's a lot more involved than this. In the Gospels, they say they had Passover. Um, they had drink. Jesus gave out something to drink. He broke the bread. Uh, they sang a hymn. They found out who was going to betray Jesus. Other details there. And the authors of the Gospel all knew what a Passover was. So there's no reason to put a lot of details in there. When you read the account in Luke, there's a few more details there because Luke, who's a Gentile, is trying to get a bit, better picture of what happens there. When John the Baptist saw Jesus, he said, when he was baptizing, Jesus is there. In the, line, in the crowd, he says, Behold, the Lamb of God takes away the sins of the world. What kind of statement was that? How did John understand this? We have in the Passover, we have a lamb that has to be unblemished, that's killed. We have the lamb's blood that is used to protect the house and the cover. In the Passover events, we're going to break down some of the things now because the details aren't in the New Testament, but there are other things that happen during this event. It's a, it's a full meal, it's a ceremony, it's a lot of activities, and there's four major sections to the Passover Seder, and they're broken up in four sections by special drinks or wines, okay? They would have cup number one, two, three, and four, and there's four cups. And let's turn back, Exodus 6. Six to seven. Exodus six, six and seven gives four promises of God. He says, Wherefore say the children of Israel, I am the Lord, I will, number one, bring you out from under the burden of the Egyptians. I will rid you of their bondage. I will redeem you with a stretched out arm with great judgments. And I will take you for me for a people. I will accept you, completely accept you. We have these four cups in the Seder. Um, the first cup is often called the cup of sanctification, the cup that sets apart, the cup that says, you are my people. Again, this is Passover. The second cup is the cup of, it's called the cup of judgment because it's a judgment on Egyptians and the Egyptian gods. It's also called the cup of praise because you're praising God that he judged the Egyptians and the Egyptian gods. God's promising to do this. I will do this, right? I will do this. And of course, we know that they all celebrated when the Red Sea decided to come back just at the right time to cover up the Egyptian armies, right? The Egyptian gods were humiliated. And the third cup is called the cup of redemption. I want you to read that portion again, the end of verse 6. I will redeem you with a stretched out arm with great judgments 
you want to think. And you, anybody have a picture in your head of what something in the Bible that might have had outstretched arms? Just you know, think about it. Let the Holy Spirit lead you. But what's the difference? The first one was about rescuing them, right? Rescuing the Jews. The third cup here is about redeeming. Rescue talks about rescuing someone who's in danger, right? From a burning building. The context here is actually rescue from slavery. You go in and you find the person that's enslaved and you take them away and you, and you run and you rescue them, right? What is redemption? Redemption means paying for it. Jesus, I mean, God always reminded the Israelites, I made you and I bought you. His two claims to ownership. I made you, if that's not, if that's not good enough, I also purchased you. I paid for you to come back out. This redemption here. And the fourth cup is called the cup of acceptance, where I will accept you as my own. Okay? These are the four stages of a Passover. In between the second and third one is two sort of matzah. Matzo, the bread, flat bread, Jewish bread, right? Um, this bread, they would take it and they would break it. This is what Jesus did. But there's a lot more details to this. The matzah is interesting. In the modern Jewish Passover Seder, it takes the place of sacrifice. Ever since the temple was destroyed in 70 AD, they haven't been able to do any real sacrifices. Which means they've made up other things. And the matzah here, at the time, who's seen matzah? Right? Got stripes on it, got little holes in it. And matzah, it represents sacrifice. The lamb is sacrifice, right? But matzah, bread. Christ held a big piece of matzah and he broke it. How did he break it? In the Passover, it's broken up into three equal pieces. The bread itself is stripes. The Bible says, by his stripes we are healed. The Messiah has stripes, matzah has stripes. Matzah has holes in it. Psalm 22 says that, that he was pierced for our transgressions. Ask an Orthodox Jew, why does your matzah have stripes and holes in it? And they'll say, <coughs> I don't know. You know. And they'll take the matzah after the second cup. So the second cup is we've been rescued from Egypt. They'll break it up into three equal, even pieces. And set them aside. They have a little, like a cloth container with three pouches in it. Put one in one pouch, one in the second pouch, one in the third pouch. They divide it up into three equal pieces. Wonder what that means. They take the middle middle portion, take it out, cut it, and break it in half. They break it in half. And one half they put back in the pouch. Other half they wrap up in a piece of linen. And they go hide it in the house someplace. They hide it. Put it away. And in a modern Passover, it's a children's game. You know, they hide the sacrifice. We hide Easter eggs. Okay? So they, they'll go around the house and they will find that. And when, when the child finds the hidden, afikomen is the term it's used. It means the one that's coming after. Which can sound very religious, but also means the one that comes after, like dessert. Okay? But it, it has a special meaning there. The one that comes after. When the child finds this, it's hidden someplace, they bring it back and they unwrap it. At that point, then they do the third cup. The third cup is what's key here. It's the cup of redemption, redemption from slavery. God punished the evil that had held them enslaved. God punished Pharaoh. God punished the evil system. God punished, if you will, the world system. He destroyed it. He gave them a way of escape. He opened up the Red Sea, brought them into a brand new place. When God instituted Passover, he said, 
from now on, this is the new year. We made a brand new calendar. And it said, this is now a new year. And, and as a result, there are like three different calendars that Jews follow. You have a civil year, and then you have a religious year, and a, and a um, Levitical year. But it's a brand new year. So in partaking of Passover, you are part of celebrating the fact that God was going to redeem you from sin. He was going to pay for it with blood, and you will be a brand new creature. It's a new year, clean year, start over again. This third cup, again, I want you to imagine you're the disciples and you're going through the Passover. Everything's normal, you've done it a million times. And after the first cup, it says Jesus got up from supper and started washing their feet. And this is weird. We, had, we got our feet washed when we walked in the room. That would have been normal. But now, partway through the meal, we're washing feet. And Jesus insists that this...
baptism or communion. When God commands us to do something, does, it, does that mean that you have to do it? No. I was taught about baptism when I was young. I got saved at a very early age, some kind of place, six or seven-ish thereabouts. And I was told I should be baptized. Is that a command? Yes. Will I risk heaven if I don't do it? No. Because it's still grace. Heaven's the free gift. If I want to honor God, I'll honor his commandments. But I spent most of my growing up life saying, no, I'm, I don't need to be baptized. I don't have to. Right? You can imagine some snotty kid saying that. I don't have to. Right? I should go to heaven. I don't need to be baptized. The guy said you should do it, but I don't have to. And I would, I said, well, when I find a church that is the church that's my permanent church, then I'll do it. That was my way of saying, I'm not sticking with your church, Mom and Dad, when I get out of here. So, yeah, I was kind of snotty. Eventually I did. At some point, it says I, was, I was in a small Messianic Jewish church in Pikesville where I said, you know what? i got to get baptized. And that was not the church I ended up in. And God says, you know, just do it. It is a sign. It is a sign of the death, burial, and resurrection. Jesus taught the disciples to do baptisms. Jesus never did perform one himself. Baptisms come from the mikvah. It's a Jewish tradition of atoning, of washing away, making some one, one, one clean. John the Baptist was doing baptisms. That's where he got his name, right? Doing baptisms, and he was performing mikvahs for people and saying, prepare for the day of the Lord. Prepare for the Messiah's coming. John the Baptist was the last prophet before Jesus, the last prophet of Israel. He was the one that was declaring that the next prophet is the Messiah, one of the signs required in Malachi. Again, the lamb that takes away the sins of the world. In Matthew 28, 18, 20, Jesus came to them after he rose from the dead, after his resurrection, and he said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you, and surely I am with you until the very end of the age. Jesus commanded his disciples to baptize. Jesus never did it himself. He taught them how to do it. They didn't do any baptizing between John the Baptist and during Jesus' ministry. Okay? People had been... Um, Disciple of John the Baptist, they came to Jesus, no baptizing. Why? Baptizing is celebrating the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. When you are baptized, you're making a public declaration that I died, I went underground, under the water, and I came back brand new. I rose again. In Christ, you have already died. That's why you're not going to die anymore. You know? You don't die. You, you just wake up in heaven one day. Amen. You're not, you didn't stay dead. The life that I live is not me, but by the way, life of Christ that lives in me. And now you have a brand new life. You rose again. If Christ rose again, so did you. You have a brand new life. You rose again. Coming out of the water, you symbolize that. Yes, it's symbolic. But Jesus said to do it. And in that symbolism, you are identifying with Christ in a public way. After that, all the disciples baptized people. It's been part of the church. Jesus said to do it, so we do it. John 6, 53, 58. This is what I referenced earlier. Jesus was telling the crowd, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood as eternal life, and I will raise him up in the last day. Probably not a favorite opening sermon for a new pastor. Again, are you talking about cannibalism? But Jesus has made that real clear. Luke twenty-two nineteen. 19, he took bread and gave thanks and broke it and gave it to them, saying, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Also the cup of the supper, he said, this cup is a new testament of my blood, which is shed for you. 
The mikvah was to prepare people for the impending arrival of the Messiah. Jesus took that Jewish ceremony and said, if you're in the church, if you're in my family, this is what you do. Once you have accepted me, you make a public declaration. Is it required for you to go to heaven? Absolutely not. People that say you must be baptized to go to heaven, it's a lie. Baptismal regeneration is wicked. Trying to add something to the blood of Christ is evil. Let's face it. The thief on the cross didn't get a chance to get baptized or take communion. Turn to Revelation 3.20. How are you doing today? Good. Yes. Two sacraments Jesus commands us to do. If you love him, you keep his commandments. Eventually, I trusted him enough and get over my pride and said, fine, I'll get baptized. <laughs> yeah. And my wife's going, what is wrong with this man? I tell you. He just won't do anything right the first time. The threshold covenant. The threshold, the blood of God. That's what Acts 22 says, God's blood. God's blood was shed. In the very first Passover, a representative of God, namely a lamb, perfect lamb, blood was shed. And it was put in the doorway, in the, in the, in the outline of a cross. And that threshold is a barrier Inside that house, you are safe. Inside the blood, you are safe. Fortunately for us, we can never get outside the blood, okay? Mm. That is who we are now. We've been purchased by blood. God owns us, and we, you can't undo that. I can't walk in. I can't tell God, I want out. Okay? People say, can, can you lose your salvation? The, the cute answer is, who would want to? That's not an answer. The answer is, no. Answer is no. When you accepted Christ, you handed over your eternal destiny to Him. He owns it. If you don't like it, I gotta tell you, tough luck. Okay? If you want out of it, you know, you were purchased. I made you and I bought you. Every human being on this planet is a creation of God. God made them. Does God own them? Yes, He does what He wants to. But when you become a child of God, that is, remember, John 1, 9. When you become a child of God. In the first chapter of John, someplace in there, he gives us the power to become children of God. When you're a child of God, you're born into his family. You can't be unborn. You can't undo it. You can't cease to be your mother's child. No matter what happens. You can't undo that fact. So in Revelation 3... Behold, we've heard this first, let's listen to it afresh. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him and will sup with him and he with me. Sup. Have dinner. Commune. This verse is a favorite verse talking about getting saved. An unsaved person standing there, you're witnessing to them, and you're lifting up Christ, and Jesus is knocking at their heart saying, please let me in. And of course, the picture is that Jesus is a gentleman, the door knobs on the inside, only the person on the inside can open the door and let him in. It's a beautiful picture. It has nothing to do with what this verse says, though. It's a good application. If you want to keep using it, it's fine. This verse is being written to a church, <coughs> being written to Laodicea, being written to a church, being written to saved people. A saved person has been given this offer. Jesus Christ says, I want to have fellowship with you. By the way, you don't see the word heart in that verse at all, right? That's because we've all seen a picture of a heart-shaped door or some, something, you know. Uh, this is Jesus Christ 
on a regular basis, on a daily basis with you and me, knocking at our heart, saying, ha, this is my house, but can I come in anyway? Asking permission to fellowship with you. If you don't want to fellowship with Jesus today, you don't have to. Same with everything else. If you don't want to be baptized, you don't have to. If you don't want to commune, you don't have to. Am I going to cheat myself? Yes. Am I going to completely miss what God has for me? Yes. If you love me, you'll keep my commandments. That's not an ultimatum. That's not like... When we, people hear that phrase, you think it's some abusive husband saying it, right? No. This is the other way around. Since you love me, keep my commandments is automatic. It's, it, 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 you, you'll just do it without, without realizing, without any stress or problem, because you love me. We'll come in and sup with him. In communion, we celebrate the fellowship and intimacy we now have with God. Proverbs 18 says, there's a friend that stays closer than a brother. Before you were saved, you were stuck in your own skull. You were you inside of you. Nobody could get in. You could never have any fellowship with anybody else, really. The closest relationship you might have is a sibling, and they didn't know the real you. And right around the age of 13 to 15, you realize I'm stuck in my own body, my own skull, my own brain, and I am alone. And you try to fill that loneliness in, and then eventually you get married, and you say, that'll take care of my loneliness, and you realize you marry someone else who's lonely. We need someone who lives with us on the inside. We accept Jesus Christ. We accept his payment. We accept who he is, and he becomes a friend that's closer than a brother. No human being will ever know the thoughts that you have better than Jesus. No human being can be as close to you as Jesus. Be kind of scary, right? One of the most amazing proofs of God's love for you is that He's moved in, He knows your thoughts, and He stays. <laughs> okay? Yeah. Yeah, I'll, I'll stay here. I've declared them righteous. I believe they're righteous. I'm going to step out in faith and know they're righteous because someday they will actually be righteous. So I'm going to live in the finished work that I provided. I'm going to move in here. And I'm going to do my best to try to keep the place clean and help out and help explain, be our friend, be a comforter. And he is there on the inside. And that's love. Right? Someone gets inside your brain and lives with your thoughts and decides to stay there. It's amazing. But he will come in and sup with you. Communion. Communion, submission, fellowship, interaction, friendship with God. Jesus told the disciples, you called me master, and that's true, because I am. But now I call you friends. Friends. A friend, put it this way, on a job, your boss does not have to tell you why. Right? If you're in the military and your commanding officer says, do this, you don't say, can you please give me a good, a good reason for that? <laughs> I don't explain myself to you. The master doesn't explain himself. Jesus, I'm a friend. I will explain myself. That's what today is all about, explaining himself. Why do we do communion? He's explained it. Why do we come to church? He's explained it. What is the future for mankind? He's explained it. He's given us all the details there. It's a foundation for obedience. Not law, not rules, intimacy. Lord Jesus, we thank you so much for this, this time. We pray that, that this will be a lot for people to think about, that you will teach all much better than I did today, and that you will help make these things real, help us to enjoy these, these thoughts, these sacraments, help us to submit, help us to just rest in your love. If there's anybody here that has not accepted Christ, anybody listen to this online, Hopefully you had a better understanding of what Christ came to do for you. If you have not accepted Christ, just pray this prayer. Lord Jesus, thank you for paying for my sin. Thank you for redeeming me. 
Thank you for loving me. If you prayed that prayer, you've accepted him, accepted his payment, accepted his life, and you are now a brand new creation. So God, as we can go from this place, God, we pray that you would keep people safe, keep people healthy. And once again, we just thank you for the price you paid and thank you for the confidence that it gives us. We love you. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 At this time, those who are in the room like to give, you have an opportunity to give. Those who are online, you can go to ggwo.org slash donate, go to your missions and local needs button, type or select Owings Mills. Also, those who are online who would like to write and find out more information concerning Jesus Christ or you just accepted Jesus Christ and you'd like to know how to start off or just to receive love in Christ, you can write to us. Grace Family Fellowship, P.O. Box 1435, Owings Mills, Maryland, 21117. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for today, how much we've learned concerning the Passover, concerning communion, concerning what Jesus Christ has done for us, Lord, as we have listened and learned and maybe taken some notes, but really just thought about the love of Christ for us and how we can celebrate him every time we take communion, Lord. We thank you and praise you for your son. Pray, Lord, that as we go out these doors, that it won't be just until the next time we take communion, but that we would have a time every day to really thank you. Thank your son for his finished work, Lord. Pray that you will continue to bless, Lord, as we know you will in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, this time we'll close. Everyone here this morning. And, uh, I trust that you were edified by the message. Heavenly Father, we, we just thank you, Lord, that uh, you brought us here today to just once again reflect upon the uh, you and the uh, greatness of uh, what you have accomplished uh, through your Son uh, on the cross. Thank you, God, for that. Bless us now as we go. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.